one day after talking to your uh, football player friend that uh, telling them that you are taking a physics class your friend um, gets happy about it because he has a problem and he thinks that maybe now that you know some kinematics you're going to be able to help him his problem is the following he's a football player and um, he's very fast but he's noticed that when he is about to throw a pass he has to slow down to make a precise throw if he continues running at top speed when he's throwing the pass he finds that his precision is very poor so he wants to find out how much is he slowing down when he when he's throwing a, a pass so he wants you to tell him his speed when he throws a pass so you guys decide that you're gonna tackle the problem and so you go to the football field and you climb to a light tower and so yeah, you can have a good view of the field and your friend starts running and then he throws the football and continues running so you take pictures of this, record the time maybe you can take a movie but it's the same as taking multiple pictures and uh, you record the time for each picture so the trajectory of your friend in the pictures looks like this So you have your pictures, you have some uh, data for the time. So before you can start analyzing his motion, the first thing that you have to do is set up a coordinate system. So you decide that this is going to be your x-axis in the pictures, that this is going to be your y-axis, and the position at any instant of time, t, let's say here it's going to be given by two numbers you throw a line that is perpendicular to the x-axis down until it touches the x-axis and that's your x-coordinate for this point P and you throw another perpendicular to the y-axis and at the point where it intersects the y-axis that is your y-coordinate y so p you can do that the same the same thing for all points all the data points that you have and you can have a table where you write all your data with x y and t information for every point let's make the point a little bit more clear here okay so now that you have your data the, uh, what what is the next thing that you have to do? You have your you find your x and y components for all the data. You have the time information. What's the next step? Now you remember that in physics class, when you cover one-dimensional motion, an important idea related to the velocity is displacement. So the next thing that you are decide to do is calculate the displacement of your friend near the point where he threw the football so you pick some points before and after call this say point A call this point B and you want to calculate the displacement the change in position of your friend when going from A to B you can draw the vector position at those different times at T sub A your friend was at point A that's the vector r t a and at point b your friend was at location b and the vector that describes that position is r evaluated r t b having the two position vectors you can calculate the displacement vector between those two points that will be a vector that goes from a all the way to b and this is your delta r a B. That is a vector that describes how much did the position of your friend change. Having that vector, the displacement vector, you can calculate the average velocity of your friend when moving between points A and B. Following the same rule that you used before, you will take the displacement between points A and B and you will divide it by the difference in time between A and B. 
the only difference with one dimensional motion is now you're dealing with a vector and to do that you will have to take the write down the components of delta r a b the x and the y components divide each one by the delta t the time difference and get the components of the average velocity notice that the vector delta r has two components which you can call delta x along the x direction and delta y along the y direction so your average velocity between a and b would be delta x along the x direction plus delta y along the y direction divided by delta t so your average velocity therefore would have two components for the x component you will have delta x delta t and for the y specify here a b if you want that kind of looks bad Let's just leave it like that plus delta y over delta t for the y direction so your average velocity between a and b has those two components so you calculate these two components and you tell your friend well this is your average velocity but he's not very happy about it of course he doesn't think that you did such a great job because when he threw the football he remember that he was at point p right here at point p as you can see from the from the dots that denote his position his position is not changing very much he has slowed down quite a bit and the number that you're giving him seems for the velocity sounds a little too high for him because he knows he slowed down more than that so he tells you that you probably can do a better job that doesn't seem right so you look at your data and you realize that that yes you could have done a better job if you had gotten if you had calculated your average velocity using points two points that were on both sides of p but closer than the ones you picked closer than a and b so you go ahead now and pick a couple of other points put those in yellow now you pick this one and you pick this one you can call that a prime and b prime and you do the same thing you draw your vector displacement between those two points that vector will be delta r a prime b prime once you calculate that vector displacement you divide by the difference in time between b prime and a prime and there you have your average velocity between a prime and b prime which you think should be a good approximation to the actual velocity of your friend at point P. You give this number, you show this number to your friend and he's still not convinced that that's a, that's a, that's a good number so he asks you to continue to do this process until you get the exact, his exact velocity at point P. Well this is kind of a tall order but you nonetheless start working on it you take, you get points progressively closer and closer, you calculate the average velocity between those two points and you notice something curious. You notice that as you calculate that the first number that you calculated, the average velocity between A and B was some number. When you calculated the average velocity between A prime and B prime, you got a number that was slightly different. When you calculated the average velocity for two points that were even closer than A prime and B prime, you got another number for the average velocity but this number was not so different from this one in other words the process of moving closer and closer to point P seems to be arriving to a limit point in other words it seems to have a number to which it's getting closer and closer so after you do this uh, series after you calculate this average velocity for a few more couples of points that are really close to P you realize that there's no point in getting in continuing this process because now your velocity after the tenth iteration does not differ at all from the velocity that you obtain in your ninth iteration or if it differs it's in a tenth digit and you don't have you don't need that precision so at that point you stop 
and you tell your friend what is your final result. So the process that we just described here, mathematicians call it taking a limit. And we're taking the limit here when the two points A and B uh, move closer and closer to point P, the point of interest, we are taking the limit when the difference in time between the two points goes to zero of the quantity delta R, the displacement vector, divided by the difference in time between those two points. That limit, that number that you found uh, did not change after a number of iterations. This number is what we call the instantaneous velocity. This is the number that, for example, the speedometer in your car is telling you. It's telling you the speed, not the direction, but the speedometer in your car is giving you information about the instantaneous velocity, the instantaneous magnitude of the velocity of the car at all times. Now, since your friend was mostly interested in his speed when he threw the ball at point P, then what you need to do is find the components of the vector and uh, obtain from the components the magnitude of the vector. So the vector velocity has two components. What are these components? Well, the vector delta r, as we said before, delta r has components delta x in the x direction and delta y in the y direction. and we took the limit when delta x, when delta t, sorry, goes to zero. That's what we did. Well, that limit, you can split it into uh, the two factors that you have there. So the instantaneous velocity is the limit when delta t goes to zero of the quantities delta x over delta t in the x direction plus the limit delta t goes to zero of delta y over delta t in the y direction. This quantity, we've seen it before. This is what we call the instantaneous velocity in the x direction. This is the how fast the x location of the object is changing with time. So we're going to call that the x component of the velocity. And the second number, which is the limit of how fast the uh, y component or the y location of the object changes with time, that number we can call it the velocity in the y direction. So your vector velocity has two components. In three dimensions, it will have an additional component, of course, which it will be along the third axis. And once you have the components of the velocity vector, you can find the speed. Because speed is defined as the magnitude of the velocity vector. So that would be the square root of vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared. And this is the number that you can report back to your friend. Think of the components of the velocity has the velocity of the shadow of the object on each one of the axes. So if you throw a ball in the air, let's say, and you have two lamps set up in the room, in your lab, one lamp that is illuminating, throwing light in this direction, therefore producing a shadow of the object on this wall and you have another lamp sending out light in this direction therefore producing a shadow of the object on that wall then as the object moves see that you kick the object and it moves in trajectories in a trajectory like that as the object moves the shadows are going to move if the object at this instant of time has a velocity v this shadow is moving in this direction with a velocity v sub x and the shadow on the other wall is moving at this instant of time is moving with a velocity given by the y component of the velocity of the vector velocity that is the velocity of the shadow on that wall let me change the color here to make it more 
clear this vector is the y component of the velocity of the object and that velocity has two components as we said this is the vector x component of the velocity of the object so think of those components as the projections of the vector velocity along each one of the axes. A very important thing to remember about the vector velocity is the following. If this is the trajectory, the vector velocity at some specific point P here is a vector that is tangent to the curve. direction, the line defined by the direction of the vector is a line that touches the curve only at one point and that is point P. You call that vector the velocity of the object at point P. It is tangent to the curve. I don't have time here to show you a demonstration of this but you can see very clearly that if you take points A and B on both sides of P, the vector average velocity between A and B it's a vector that goes from A well that's the vector displacement and the vector velocity is parallel to that vector so as you take A and B closer and closer to point P you can see that the average velocity the direction of the average velocity is going to coincide it's going to become closer and closer to the velocity to the direction of the velocity vector at point P. So it's important as I said to remember that the instantaneous velocity is tangent to the trajectory of the object. This is always true for any kind of motion that you have. So the velocity vectors at different points along a trajectory point in the direction defined by the tangent to the curve at that point so at this point the velocity vector would point in that direction at this point the velocity vector points in that direction at this point this could be the velocity vector this point this would be the direction of the velocity vector and so on the magnitude of the vectors of course depend on how fast the speed of the object at that point you cannot tell the speed of the object just by looking at the trajectory but just look, by looking at the trajectory, you can tell the direction of the velocity.